Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is day three of five of the Spring 2022 Royce Fellowship uh, research presentations. We have hopefully four students presenting on their projects today. Um, for those who don't know, the Royce Fellowship is uh, was founded in 1996 with the generosity of a uh, donation from Chuck Royce, uh, class of 61. Uh, and it allows uh, undergraduate students to do um, conduct uh, independent uh, engaged research projects of their own design across the United States and around the world. Uh, we have four examples today of that. The application for the next cohort is currently open with a deadline of March 4th. We invite students who are interested uh, to reach out to either myself or Maggie Goddard, our graduate assistant, um, and faculty who know students to recommend that they reach out as well. I think that's good on my part. Our first speaker will be Zena Dolan, who is presenting on combating anti-Black racism in the U.S. immigration system. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for that introduction, Jesus. Um, I will go ahead and share my presentation. Everybody can see? Fantastic, okay. Um, well, I think I know most of you, but um, my name is Zena. I'm a senior studying international relations um, with a focus on migration and in particular US immigration policies towards Latin America. Um, first, I wanted to provide a little bit of background around my project, which is called Combating Anti-Black Racism in the US Immigration System. Um, so in the summer of 2020, I interned at an organization called New Sanctuary Coalition, which is a grassroots migrant justice organization in New York City. And in this role, I helped oversee their free legal clinic where we helped asylum seekers with basically every step of the asylum process. And in this work, I worked a lot with many Garifuna asylum seekers, which is an Afro-Indigenous group in Central America. And there's a really large um, Garifuna community in the Bronx that has an established relationship with New Sanctuary Coalition. So through this work with many Black migrants and asylum seekers, I became interested in the intersections of migration justice as well as anti-Black racism. Notably, the summer of 2020 was also like the resurgence of a conversation about racial justice after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and this also informed my interest in this work. Um, through my studies of immigration, I honestly had not learned much about anti-Blackness in the immigration system. There's very little work done around this so far, but what I was able to find showed me how important it was. Um, Black migrants are deported at triple the rate of other migrants. They're six times more likely to be put in solitary confinement when detained, and they're more likely to be denied asylum than any other race. Um, this led me to my conclusion, which is that the literature and lived testimonies of Black migrants demonstrate that immigration advocacy organizations like New Sanctuary Coalition, who largely serve Latinx migrants, currently fail to meet the needs of and support Black migrants as they navigate an immigration system and society steeped in anti-Blackness. So this was kind of a motivation for my project moving forward. Um, this is my project timeline. So for the first couple of weeks, I conducted a literature review on racialization, specifically anti-Blackness and migration. Then my plan was to interview 20 Black migrants and asylum seekers working with NSC to understand their distinct experiences navigating the US immigration system. Then I was planning on creating a toolkit and training materials for New Sanctuary Coalition staff and volunteers to combat anti-Blackness in their work. A thing to note here is that many people involved in the immigration system, specifically in a volunteer capacity, are white and also white women. Um, and often they're really well-intentioned, but don't necessarily have the tools or training materials to be able to act in ways that are informed by racial justice. So that's a specific area that I was hoping to develop materials in. And then I was hoping to engage in a feedback process with my interviewees, as well as the New Sanctuary Coalition um, community, including volunteers, translators, and staff members. And lastly, after this feedback process, I was hoping to implement materials at um, New Sanctuary Coalition going forward and share those with other immigration advocacy organizations. Um, so hopefully that work could spread. Um, you could probably tell by my language here that I was hoping to do a lot of things. Um, unfortunately, on June 1st, 2021, after I had received the Royce funding, the entire staff of the New Sanctuary Coalition Legal Clinic quit all of a sudden, and the organization as a whole folded by 
the end of the summer. Um, this was actually a, a huge tragedy because um, thousands of migrants were working with New Sanctuary Coalition in various parts of their immigration and asylum process. And this left many people stranded without any sort of legal or other support. Um, and the least severe of those impacts was that I no longer had a voice project because it was all based around my relationship with this community partner. Um, so throughout the month of June, I did some pivoting and finding a new community partner so I could still learn and engage in this work somehow. Um, so I reached out to my networks to see what immigration organizations could take on an extra set of hands for the summer. This included Kate Goldsman, who works at, as the center manager at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. And she connected me with an organization called Respond Crisis Translation, which, as you can see here, is a collective of language activists providing compassionate, effective, and trauma-informed interpretation and translation services for migrants, refugees, and anyone experiencing language barriers. And at that time, um, Respond was looking for support with language justice, translation, and interpretation projects. And I was really excited about this. Um, so I met with them and was able to um, devise a project in collaboration with them. So for the rest of the summer, I worked with Respond. Um, I built translation glossaries and language re repositories in languages spoken primarily by Black migrants. So in this way, I was able to kind of preserve some of the original intentions of my project around anti-Blackness and immigration advocacy. These languages included Haitian Creole, Tigrinya, Amharic, Swahili, Wolof, and Pular. Um, for example, here you can see um, an Amharic translated copy of the I-589, which is the asylum application form. So this is the kind of like gives you an idea of the work that I was doing. Um, and in addition, I also contributed towards fundraising efforts to pay translators working with Black migrants and asylum seekers. Let me get some water. <laughs> Um, so overall, um, I learned a lot through this journey and this project. Um, the main thing that I would learn, as you could probably guess, is flexibility and adaptability in the face of uncertainty. Um, I had a really detailed project that I was excited about and then kind of had to rebuild that from the ground up. And I think that's a skill that will be really applicable um, from here moving on. I also learned the value of reaching out for support. When I had no project, I had to cast a really wide net asking people if they could connect me to people that they knew. And this was also a really valuable skill that paid off. Um, I also embraced some unexpected and new learning. For example, I never imagined that I would be doing um, translator work with Amharic translators, but that was awesome to learn about a new area of the world, a new culture that I didn't expect. And I also learned the importance of leaning on my advisors and the race community throughout this process because they were extremely supportive and helpful. Um, and I wanna give some acknowledgements before I finish to my primary advisors, Dr. Elena Shi and Kate Goldman at Clax, and also the, the entire NSC community, including my direct supervisor, Miguel Orea, for um, their support, even when the project wasn't able to happen. I also wanna thank the Royce cohort who are an incredibly like inspiring group of people and also providing me with a lot of support when my project didn't go as planned. And lastly, I wanna thank Chuck Royce for making this entire journey and learning possible. Um, so that concludes my presentation. Next, I will introduce Nick Robley Strauss, who will be presenting on multimodality in the artist studio. Thanks. Thank you, Zena, for the lovely presentation. Um, wait. Wait, technical difficulties. You have to hit the slideshow button, not the share button. Oh, sorry. Whoops. Okay. Perfect. Um, welcome. My name is Nick, um, and I'm here to present on an ontological crisis. Um, as a student and defender of the arts, uncertain climate futures challenge the basis for my chosen fixation. The function of adornment, aesthetic, and even entertainment is undermined by impending realities. Art, often cited as the expression of culture's successes and material abundance, misaligns with pressing goals of sustainability, equity, and degrowth. Um, 
my voice project is investigating the role that our artists can play in the future, um, if any at all. And uh, in the shorter term, looking at how they navigate uh, conflicting ideas. Uh, my voice project this past summer asks three questions. How does art artistic production intersect with um, late modernity and hyperconsumption? How do artists respond in their practice to climate catastrophe? And is there a role for artists at all in securing a future? Uh, to answer this question, um, I, I don't have to look very, the first question, I don't have to look very far. Um, this morning I was uh, in, in my own little painting studio. I, I went through numerous uh, latex gloves um, and there's a real consciousness of the accumulated waste um, in every studio I looked at, including um, the one I am I'm working in now. Um, Many of the materials are, are based in plastic and, and when not often more toxic materials. Um, so in, in the mode of play in the studio, there is also a great weight of the environmental costs of, of that opportunity. Um, increasingly successful artists um, are moving towards what I'm, I call the factor, factorification of the artist studio as um, they have to scale up their practice in order to meet the financial and investment demands of the art market. So in many ways, the modern conception of success in the art world is, poses a problem um, in relationship to hyperconsumption um, with art. Um, and of course, the, this, this idea of scale and production is not entirely new. It goes back to, to guilds and uh, many historical institutions that similarly um, were set on producing art. But beyond uh, just the material um, aspect of art, uh, my project pushes back upon uh, this idea that digital solutions are are the best case scenario for uh, sustainable art. Um, their, their promise of spaceless, wasteless art um, doesn't, doesn't get at the question of art not having always clear function or oper uh, a use in, in terms of a climate future. But in fact, uh, the mining and labor that goes into building uh, technologies themselves have environmental impacts um, and will produce waste once, once uh, the devices no longer fu function, usually toxic waste. Um, so in many ways, I, I think these digital solutions are a, a displacement of the material waste aspect of art. Um, and therefore, for the sake of my project and my own personal interests, I am, I, I push this aside as a similarly problematic aspect. Um, wait, did my slides get, there it is. Okay, um, so I, in my discovery, I, I'm looking at artists who have unconventional relationships to materiality, um, and I categorize these into three categories. The first one is art is living. Um, so this is an artist, Corin um, Hewitt, in, uh, who's, who's quite famous. He's the only artist in my presentation who I didn't speak to. Um, but this is, I think, is a, a, a really important piece that intervenes in the idea of sustainable practices in art. Um, so this is a studio apartment that um, was in the Whitney where he, he lived for um, the length of an exhibition. And so he's incorporating um, sustenance, uh, the practice of feeding himself into his artistic practice. Um, so he will be um, cooking himself dinner 
and then he will replicate the um, the food and the process in um, a three dimensional uh, way with um, molding clay, and he will photograph both the actual um, process as well as the um, fictitious process that he he's sculpting, and then inevitably he consumes the food, he disassembles the sculpture down to its parts. The food waste goes into a worm bin that he hides underneath this um, studio, and the process continues. And so this, th this concept is the idea that, uh, yes, art has, has waste, it has these outputs, but um, how can there be a cyclical process? Um, and this is something that I think offers one um, solution towards this idea of art as postponed waste, art as something that um, will we'll not have a function at some point and will have to be disposed of. So this next artist is Jen Sims. Um, she's based in Gill, Massachusetts, um, which is close to where I grew up. Um, she is a, a teacher, I, I think in many ways, her um, based on my visit to her to her home and her home studio, um, she embodies a lot of the ideas uh, that I brought up with Corin Hewitt. She's a baker. She makes um, sculptural breads, and those are consumed. Um, she also has a very um, abundant garden that she considers considers integrated into artistic practice. However, she does produce formal work as well. Um, that incorporates, incorporates ideas of uh, the cyclical into it. So this is an installation she had at um, the de Cordoba um, quite a few years ago um, in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, actually, I'm not 100% sure it's Concord now that I'm thinking of it. Massachusetts, uh, that area. Um, and so these are all found materials uh, that she has assembled um, on the wall. Um, many of these are the, the little ends of soaps um, that are too small to be useful. Um, and so she's, and other objects are found on walks. Um, wait. Um, found in uh, homes. Uh, this is essentially all waste that has been reassembled um, to create big forms. Um, and uh, put in a, a gallery space. Um, but similar to, uh, you know, more direct uh, art forms where the waste is perhaps produced during the process, um, inevitably this piece had to be disassembled and returns to its original state of, as a dispos disposable objects. Um, yes, and so I, I refer to this as art as, re, as repurpose it, purposement, art as repurpose. Um, the final category of art that I came up with is, uh, which I think most uh, effectively addresses um, the, the consideration of waste. Um, this I'm calling art as remediation. Um, this is, this is the work that actually prompted my interest in this topic. Um, this is a Pawtucket-based artist named Mae Babcock, who's a paper maker. Here I have um, just some samples. She's experimenting with different plant fibers uh, to create um, paper. And so these are books that she's constructed and she's um, seeing how the paper um, is, is essentially ineffective at uh, being standardized, and then she will play with these forms. Um, what is interesting about this process to me is that um, she's thinking about sourcing material in an unconventional way. She's going to uh, local watersheds and picking invasive species. And so her um, process of sourcing um, itself is actually a positive in terms of impact. And I think that is where this is an intervention um, from the other artists I've met with uh, working mostly around repurposing material. Um, 
So while this art at the end of the day similarly has the issue of um, taking up space and not having clear function beyond the aesthetic uh, and perhaps conceptual, the process itself um, can be seen as a, a um, function in terms of sustainability and in terms of climate solutions. Um, these last, uh, for my conclusion, I'm, I'm taking you to these images, uh, which is my, my backyard where I, I thought about these issues um, at home in the summer and a new kitten who um, thought, thought about these things alongside me. Um, but to address those three questions I brought up at the beginning, over the course of this project, um, the question of consumption became clear as ever. Every artist studio I visited and every artist I talked to discussed the constant need to account for wasted material, for um, material that must be disappeared from the studio, must um, be removed and dealt with appropriately. Um, none of the artists I spoke with um, personally felt the, the pressures of uh, the financial pressures um, that I was expecting, um, as none of them uh, relied on sale of artwork uh, to make up any significant part of their income. Um, so that is a question that that remains um, remains open ended for me. Um, how can art as uh, a financial uh, investment consider for the climate impacts. Um, the, sec the second takeaway in terms of how artists are dealing with climate catastrophe, I would say none of them are too concerned with being purists. And as a result, their relationships with material were mixed and varied and that uh, the pursuit of the aesthetic um, continues to outweigh their interest in, um, in purity and rather, um, ah, they, uh, they focus their art um, around, around occasional issues of climate, but also um, you know, pure aesthetic expression. Um, and in conclusion, I, I think I came against an issue with the initial projects, which is that perhaps the aesthetic world can't be shaped by pressing needs and inventive solutions, and rather they can only be found along the way. And that the pursuit of art artistic practices are, as I initially suggested, uh, not about function and cannot be made about function. And that um, perhaps the role of the artist is, cannot be about securing a future. And that, um, that, is, a, that is a struggle that that is just a part of the studio and will continue to be a part of the studio. Um, bef before I go, I would love to, I would like to acknowledge um, the five artists who who worked with me and let me visit them: Jen Sims, Mae Babcock, Charlotte Somerville, Anya Klopaki, and Aaron Woodbury. Um, I'd also uh, like to acknowledge Chuck Rice for bringing together this wonderful cohort. Um, with such varied projects, and of course, Jesus and Maggie for, for leading us along the way. Um, and grim as it may seem, art can exist functionless in a future. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Jamila Beasley.
sorry. Um, can everyone see my slides? Perfect. Um, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Jamila Beasley. Um, I'm a senior studying American Studies and International and Public Affairs. And my Royce project is entitled Smash Grammatical Patriarchy. And this project follows the current US-based caste abolition movement and investigates the crucial role and framework of grammatical patriarchy put forth by Dalit feminists. So just a bit of of background on who I am and how this shapes my work. So um, I identify as an Indian Muslim caste oppressed woman. These identities are important to why I'm interested in caste and gender in the South Asian American diaspora, existing as a caste oppressed religious minority in South Asian spaces that are overwhelmingly compromised of or comprised of dominant caste Indians is something I've been grappling with all my life. And this work has allowed me to delve deeper into those experiences. Another important part of how I came to this project is my experience as a sexual assault peer educator on Brown's campus for the past four years. So working in sexual and gender-based violence prevention and survivor support has been foundational to my understandings of power, accountability, and healing. And it was actually through this work that I came to my original research plan that later changed. Um, so just to go over some crucial concepts for those who are unfamiliar with caste. Um, caste is a descent-based structure of oppression that organizes people into prescriptive unequal strata from birth. Caste privilege works through the control of land, labor, education, media, white collar professions, and political institutions. And I want to recognize that there are other cultures and societies where caste systems exist, but for the purposes of my work, I'm referring specifically to the caste structure originating in South Asia. So the modern day nation states of India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Um, and although that this this structure originated in South Asia, caste follows South Asians wherever they go. It remains a critical factor in diasporic community relationships. The second concept is Brahmanical patriarchy. So Brahmanical patriarchy describes the inextricable relationship between patriarchy and caste. Caste purity is maintained through heterosexual endogamy and through controlling the bodies of people of marginalized genders. Essentially, this means marrying and procreating within one's caste is essential to maintaining caste hierarchies. Um, actually, I'm gonna go back. So this pyramid kind of is just a diagram that shows um, how caste functions. So you have Brahmins at the top, Shudras at the bottom of the caste pyramid, and then those who are excluded out of the pyramid are Dalits, who were formerly known as untouchables. And um, Shudras, Dalits, and Adivasis would be considered caste oppressed in this context. Um, so now I just want to kind of begin with an image that tells an important story. This story illustrates why caste, and more specifically, Brahmanical patriarchy, is in fact relevant to and implicates those of us in the United States. In November 2018, Indian Twitter erupted after a photograph of former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey holding up a poster that read, Smash Brahmanical Patriarchy was posted to the social media platform. As soon as the image began circulating, Dorsey was reprimanded by Indian Twitter users for being Hindu phobic and spreading Brahmin hate. In response to the outcry, a member of Dorsey's team quickly put out an apology reiterating Twitter's dedication to remaining quote unquote impartial. This brings us to important questions. Why did this poster garner such a visceral reaction? And why was Dorsey's response such a disappointment to Dalit feminists? Um, so here's a closer look at the actual poster that Dorsey was holding. You can see underneath the word smash for manical patriarchy is equalitylabs.org which is a Dalit civil rights organization based in the US. Remember their name, they're important and will come up again. 
I think that one big takeaway from this situation is knowing that the concept of romantical patriarchy seems very daunting and unfamiliar for many, especially those outside of the South Asian community, but that doesn't mean it's not relevant and important to understand. Impartiality isn't real. Instead, Dorsey chose to be complicit in the silencing of Dalit femmes. So where did this project begin? Um, in fall 2020, I stumbled across a podcast talking about the gaps in support for Dalit survivors of sexual violence in the US while preparing for an education in initiative that I was leading as a sexual assault care education coordinator. Um, it was from this series of podcasts called Cast in the USA. Um, this one specifically was how women's bodies are used to reinforce caste hierarchy. And this kind of led me to my Royce project. And originally I had a very narrow scope on the project. I was interested specifically in identifying the gaps in culturally informed survivor support practices of South Asian domestic violence organizations in the US. Notoriously, these organizations have been founded and led by dominant caste Indian women, caste oppressed women and other marginalized gendered people have often felt unwelcome and unsupported in these spaces due to the lack of understanding around caste based sexual violence. However, kind of starting the project, I quickly realized that in a remote capacity, these understanding these nuances would not only be very difficult, but weren't really at the forefront of what the understaffed South Asian domestic violence organization I was volunteering at needed at the time. And the most important part of community engaged work is to respond to the needs of your community partners and to not be extractive. Um, so I kind of came to the conclusion that I wasn't ready to do this specific research. It remains really meaningful to me, but I needed to think more expansively. So while this was all going on, um, I was actually connected to the Dalit Civil Rights Organization I previously mentioned, Equality Labs. Um, this project kind of came full circle because it was the executive director of EL, Kanmori Sandarajan, who was the artist who designed the graphic of the poster that Jack Dorsey was holding that set off Indian Twitter. She was also the host of the podcast, Cast in the USA, that um, led me to understanding the role of um, caste based sexual violence in the US. And Tenmori and Equality Labs are really at the forefront of work around caste and gender in the US, but also more broadly around the nascent movement for caste protections. Um, and I became increasingly interested in the role of Dalit feminist organizing in broader caste abolitionist movement building. Um, oh, sorry, that was kind of the pivot from one project to the other. Um, yeah, so I became increasingly interested in the role of Dalit feminist organizing in the broader movement. Um, and for some context, um, in the past two years, caste discrimination has broken national deadline headlines multiple times. Um, in 2020, the state of California sued Cisco, which is a multi multinational tech company based in Silicon Valley, on behalf of a Dalit engineer who was discriminated against by his dominant cast managers. In spring 2021, many things happened. Santa Clara County held a public hearing discussing the possibility of cast being added as a protected class in the county. Again, Equality Labs was leading the charge. Around the same time, the Cal State Students Association passed a resolution supporting the addition of caste as a protected category in all 23 of the California State University systems discrimination policies. These student organiz organizers were also affiliated with EL. It was clear to me that there was something unique about this Dalit feminist organization and their approach to organizing. Um, and then later that spring, another serious case of class exploitation in New Jersey came out. Um, so then I decided like, I really wanted to work with this organization. And in July, 2021, I attended unlearning caste supremacy workshops led by Equality Labs. I spent around 25 hours in total over that month attending trainings each week, participating in the debrief sessions and completing assigned 
readings. And I know that for me and many others in attendance, these workshops were absolutely transformative. They covered content around the foundations of grammatical patriarchy, the history of caste in South Asia and the diaspora. Um, and more importantly, well, also importantly, they took a unique trauma-informed healing justice approach to understanding oppression. So there was this idea that systems of violence have this cognitive and somatic foundation, and that in order to achieve liberation, we have to put in the work to heal from our ancestral and intergenerational trauma. And this graphic kind of just is one of the ones that they used throughout the workshop to kind of shape how we as South Asians need to think about caste and liberating ourselves from it. So then following these trainings, I became involved in EL's organizing around university caste protections. Um, students and faculty at college and university campuses around the country are building intercaste, interfaith coalitions to push universities to add caste to their anti-discrimination policies. Um, I don't really wanna go into too much detail about this organizing because some things are meant to be kept within the organizing space. Um, but I do wanna share some of the groundbreaking victories that have happened over the past few months. So in September, 2021, Colby College became the second university in the US to ban caste discrimination. In October, UC Davis became the first public university in the US to ban caste discrimination. In November, um, UC Berkeley Student Senate approved a resolution encouraging the administration to address caste-based discrimination. In December, Harvard Grad Student Union ratified a four-year union contract that included caste protections for student workers. And just in the past month, um, the Cal State University system added caste as a protected category across all 23 campuses, and this affects thousands of students and is an incredible, incredible win. And I know that this work isn't done, it's just the beginning. And although my Royce project didn't quite go as I had initially planned or expected, I couldn't be more grateful for how it did pan out. Um, on the academic side, I was able to conduct foundational research for my senior honors thesis in American studies, which furthers the questions of this project around Brahminical patriarchy and how Dalit feminist organizing is shaping the current moment in caste abolition. On the community level, I have built incredible relationships with people and fellow organizers that are rooted in this liberatory feminist caste abolitionist politics. Um, and I just wanted to share a quote from Tanmori Sandarajan, who is the executive director of Equality Labs. We have to rework the entire ways in which we love each other as we move towards caste abolition. And this is only one of the ways in which we'll be doing it. But it's such a promising way of seeing survivors building power all across the world as we shed the violence of romantical patriarchy. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone who's supported me along the way, my peers in the Royce cohort, um, Maggie Jesus, my wonderful advisor, Dr. Elena Shi. Um, and my family members who have had to suffer through me constantly talking about this work and asking questions. Um, yeah, and now I just wanna introduce the next Royce Fellow, Kuno Hambodi, um, who will be presenting the Quilombo as liberatory theory in Sao Paulo's contemporary social movements. Thank you so much, Jamila. That was a wonderful presentation. Okay. Nope. Slash. Good. Sweet. Okay. Um, thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, my project is provisionally titled The Quilombo as Liberatory Theory in Sao Paulo's Contemporary Social Movements. Um, and I'm just going to describe what's going on on screen right now because there's a lot happening. But um, my title is in orange, a top uh, small picture of a group of people standing around in a circle outside, which is overlaid on top of a, a building with a number of trees growing around that kind of take over the foreground of the space. Um, and I've included these images in this format in spite of the horrifically inaccessible graphic design to ground this presentation in 
the reclamation of space that Afro-Brazilian activists are doing in Sao Paulo every day. Um, I don't have too much time to get into the specific details of this moment, but I took both of these photos during my time in Brazil this past winter break at the site of a former prison in Sao Paulo. Um, and pictured in the foreground, we have organizers holding a community event centered around anti-carceral mental health for unhoused people. Um, and in the background, we have uh, a photo of what was the former structure of a, a carceral site. Um, and in many ways, these organizers and people are actively writing over and alongside the violent state sponsors histories that has sought to exclude and control the engagement of black peoples um, with the space. And so as we move into a discussion of Quilombismo and Marinage, I wanna ground us in, in these ideas. So for this project, my initial inquiry began through reflecting on whether marinage, which is the process of flight from slavery, sometimes leading to the establishment of new communities known as maroon communities or quilombos in Brazil, whether this framework could be useful as a lens to explore Southern African liberation movements. My father is from Namibia uh, in Southern Africa. And so understanding the stages of anti-colonial resistance, particularly to find moments of genuine decolonial transformation along these always um, complicated and compromising struggles was really compelling to me. Um, furthermore, as a black person distant from my ancestral lands, I'm interested in and inspired by historic land-based practices that have connected diasporic peoples to these life-sustaining traditions. Um, moreover, as a student of Africana studies interested in both public history and storytelling and political education, I want to explore how diasporic communities make use of these histories of resistance to enslavement and colonialism in order to build power and consciousness. Um, and finally, I found practical entry through my ongoing processing work with the John Hay Library um, for the archive of the late Professor Anani Zenyo, a mentor of mine, um, particularly his vast collection of resources and writings on the late Abigias Nascimento, um, who was a political activist and organizer and artist in Brazil, um, and who was also one of the first to think, to link rather, the quilombo to a contemporary political vision through his articulation of the theory of quilombismo. Um, so through the department and a, a course that I helped to TA, TA last spring, um, this was also, also became a site of community for my project. So some of the guiding questions that uh, I was moving from through this project were thinking about how do histories and memories of the quilombo inform the strategies of political movements in Sao Paulo? What tensions emerge through the expansion and adaptation of the quilombo to the present moment? Can such efforts be translated or replicated across cultural and historical boundaries to other diasporic contexts and communities? Um, so particularly the second question I was thinking about, the tension that exists between um, newer communities that are taking on this identity and language alongside the fact that existing remnant communities, quilombo communities, continue to exist in Brazil. Um, so methodologically, I was mainly rooted in primary source and secondary source archival research, community observation and site visits, and online ethnography and content analysis. Um, for the first of these three, I was specifically looking at the writings of political thinkers such as Abigias and Beatriz Nascimento, Clovis Mora, and countless others um, in the archives of both Professor Anani and the late um, Abigias Nascimento through the Instituto de Pesquisas y, um, Estudos uh, Afro-Brasileiros. Um, and I was also looking at uh, political documents from throughout the Black organizing history in Sao Paulo, in including mission and vision statements, conference summaries, news clippings, etc. cetera. Um, for online ethnography, I was mostly focused on social media and political education productions of various groups in Sao Paulo, including podcasts, um, Instagram Lives, which are super popular in Brazil these days, um, posts of solidarity, etc. Um, and I found this to be a particularly meaningful tool during a time when a lot of organizing was happening anyway online due to the pandemic. Um, and finally, as I mentioned on the first slide, I was able to travel to Sao Paulo and Salvador um, through the Royce Fellowship and the Portuguese and Brazilian Studies Departments. Um, and these, the two weeks that I spent in, these in this country was, I was able to visit many of the communities that I had been learning about remotely conduct participant observation research in community events and pro programming and visit sites of public memory regarding quilombismo in both cities. Uh, and having these 
um, really embodied moments of shared experience with communities in Sao Paulo, such as the um, this Samba event, which is pictured on screen at a Black cultural center in um, the Jabaquara neighborhood in Sao Paulo, um, were, were really important and special parts of both my trajectory as a student of Afro-Brazilian history and social movements in this project, as well as um, my place as a young Black person navigating my relationship to diasporic movements more generally. <clears throat> So in terms of observations and takeaways, uh, I first want to speak about the fact that engagement with the quilombo in um, contemporary Afro-Brazilian society extends far beyond the um, formal electoral and political sectors. It extends into study spaces, the classroom, libraries, samba schools, religious spaces. Um, and additionally, this there was a shift that I noticed away from the narrow political frame um, which I had originally tried to conceive my project around. Um, and I noticed that this was too restrictive um, in allowing me to access the full scope of this work. Um, further, I noticed that the more passive and theoretical associations with the idea have in many ways been replaced by more active and collective notions of the idea through specifically the verb form um, or to meet in, in the quilombo in a sense, which have been taken up as common parlance by um, contemporary groups in Sao Paulo. Um, I also noticed that the lineages of the Quilombo do not map evenly onto sources taken up in international archive. Uh, as I was working with uh, the collections of a Western-based scholar, I was reckoning with my own positionality as a research based in the West to be mindful of the silencing practices that can occur in this movement of knowledge. Um, and being able to travel to Brazil was really a, a, a confrontational moment of, of, of that gap. So I, re I really found that to be valuable. Uh, additionally, I observed that solidarity between Afro-Brazilian communities was a way that groups bridged gaps between the meaning of the idea of the quilombo, between remnant quilombos, which I mentioned earlier, which are communities who trace their origin directly to formalized historical quilombos, and those newer spaces who draw from the quilombo as a source of vision or inspiration. Um, my research also consistently reflected the significance of accessing community through space in a city where landscape and dominant narratives actively erase Black presence in history. Um, and further, when challenges to maintaining access to that land and physical territory mounted, movement organizers and communities conceived of space in more expansive terms than physical land, um, the form formation of nucleos and equilomamentos uh, facilitated this. Um, and lastly, I am sitting with the potential for study and community research as a way of processing loss um, process of the process of learning from and getting to know an individual does not stop when they leave the material world. Uh, and for me, being able to meet with people who were special to Professor Anani, visit sites throughout the diaspora that he frequented, and access new dimensions uh, of our relationships through reading his work and that of his collaborators has been uh, a truly special experience. I want to almost end by yeah, reflecting on the fact that for generations uh, of countless Black students at Brown, um, the office of Professor Anani has been a site of safety, of knowledge, of mutual understanding, of refuge, uh, and has been a quilombo of sorts. Uh, and the space and its curator uh, felt familiar before even getting to know them deeply. Throughout the summer, I curated a virtual tour of Professor Anani's office using a 360 degree camera to capture several views from throughout the space, allowing people to move through it. Um, and I included number or several digitized resources along with the with research descriptions of Professor Anani's relationships to these objects. Uh, so while the office itself these days has been emptied, as you'll see on the left, after many hours of logging very heavy boxes out, um, I, I hope that this effort will allow the space in some semblance of its richness and diasporic wisdom and community really to, to live on. So currently I am continuing to support the creation of an archive through the John Hay Library Special Collections to be accessible to future students, as well as developing a digital resource that highlights community engagement with Aquilombarsi in Sao Paulo for my capstone in Africana. Um, and during my time on Brazil, I became further interested in the relationship between Aquilombarsi and Afro-Brazilian people's understanding of their claims to belonging in Brazil as a national project, 
uh, versus like the creation of independent spaces. Uh, the flags on the left represent some of the many uh, iterations of the ways Black artists in Brazil have reappropriated national iconography and imagination to center Afro-diasporic histories that I noticed during my time there. And as such, I'm, ex I'm interested in exploring links between Black national projects in Brazil and Southern Africa, where I hope to spend time after graduation, uh, particularly following historic linkages between Brazil and Angola, as evidenced by um, this Centro Cultural Casa de Angola na Bahia, which is uh, a site that I was able to visit. Um, and Angola being a nation from which my grandfather's family originates, I hope to create space to explore both Afro-Brazilian debates over visions for free and just futures alongside um, some personal ancestral inquiry. So to close, I really wanna um, yeah, share acknowledgements and thanks to a uh, countless number of individuals, Professor Anani for um, showing me how to um, justly engage with a diasporic tradition that um, might be different from my own, but that is so deeply necessary in order to understand my place in this world and the place of, of Black people more broadly. Um, his life partner, Roseanne, for allowing me access to his materials throughout the summer. Um, my advisors, Professor Kisokan Perry, Professor Sophie Abramowitz, the Hay Library, um, Ipe Afro, which I mentioned during my talk, Swearer, um, the Royce cohort, all of you, uh, Maggie and Jesus, and finally Chuck Royce for the funding. Got to get the bag. So thank you all very much for, for coming and I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Kuno. Uh, so now we have time for Q and A. Uh, you all can ask questions of each other. Shramona, you can ask questions if you'd like to in the chat or you can just unmute yourself as well. Thanks. Uh, we have some a shout out in the chat for the four of you. Have fun in class. Uh, I wondered if each of you, you all talk about um, these like horrific moments where you have to pivot your project or like an organization folds and you have to do something else or you realize that like the community partner needs something different um, or the archives are, are doing things. Can you talk about like what that experience uh, is like uh, and how you then pivot to a new project because I'm sure future researchers are gonna encounter the same thing or similar things. So I'm wondering what's your like survival strategy for that moment. I can go. Um, my first reaction was I really did not know what to do. That was kind of my entire plan for the summer. And I also felt a lot of hesitation about reaching out to my partner organization because I felt like they had so much more on their plate at the moment. Like, for example, my direct supervisor who I had devised my project in partnership with was now unemployed. And so like his last concern was like my summer research project. Um, so I think like being patient with yourself, you have an entire summer. And so you're you're in no rush to, to start on a particular timeline. Um, and then, like I spoke about in my presentation, what really helped was like leaning on my advisors, leaning on people um, at Brown who had connections to different migration advocacy organizations who were able to help me find a, a good fit. I think building off of that, Something that I found to be necessary was just moving from an ethic of care when it comes to this type of work. So I, there was a period where I was really afraid that I wasn't gonna be able to access any materials from Professor Anani's archive. Um, and for me, I, I found myself like struggling between like frustration and also at the end of the day, it came down to needing to feel like understanding and appreciation for the fact that there are so many people involved in many of these processes who are moving through things at very different speeds, especially when there is like loss and trauma and even like what Zina is talking about, like violence and economic hardship involved. Uh, and so I think kind of trusting that the only way to reach a just outcome will be to have that ethic of care and not try to like rush things in a way that, or force things in a way that would result in, um, yeah, people feeling, um, taking advantage of or otherwise, I think that is always like a, a, an important reminder. Yeah, I think similarly, like in theory, I might've been able to do my original project. I just like 
felt an intense discomfort with it once I like was working with the organization and I continued volunteering with them just outside of the Royce because like I think it's important work and I think they're doing important work and I think that like in research again what Kuno was saying in ethics of care you're not thinking of like how much can I take from this how can I get my work done it's like what am I like my hope isn't like to you know like write my honors thesis that's like the least significant thing to me in this it's about like building community building relationships and like doing something that actually supports the ethics and the values that I'm striving towards um I somewhat in a different direction on the same question um I really found that uh almost everyone I interviewed um gave me answers I wasn't expecting, or in some instances, um, didn't find useful to my initial goals. Um, and so I think a huge part of the project is um, allowing the subjects you're working with to be um, not, not as helpful as you'd hoped, or uh, interesting in, in a way that doesn't um, end up uh, aligning with your intentions when you reached out. I think just building on that, Nick, like the idea of like taking a pivot, pivoting based on other people and really listening to the people that you're working alongside and figuring out what their sort of articulations of their goals are or their desires. And I feel like all of you are really responsive to those sort of reorientations of priorities as a way that's both about pivoting your project, but also pivoting the work more broadly, which I really appreciated in all of your presentations. Yeah, you all are asking like some really hard questions. So it's amazing to see how you then, you know, have the confidence a to like change course and not just like stay with what you committed yourself to in the beginning, um, but then also make something great out of that as well. Zina, I'm really curious why the organization folded. Honestly, it's kind of a long story, <laughs> but I think the the brief version would be that so it's it's like kind of a classic nonprofit situation where the board is like entirely wealthy white folks and the people who are actually working with the like working in person with the migrants are largely also immigrants people of color people who speak those language and are, and are interfacing with those people um so there became like a big um like gap between those two groups and the em employees of the organization were not being treated well, I think in terms of like wages, hours and like the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, and so they made a series of demands that they wanted, which the board was unwilling to meet. And so then they like their last resort kind of was to all quit in mass. Um, and then once the entire like legal portion of the organization quit, um, the entire organization like slowly fell apart over the following months. Thanks for the tea. <laughs> Jamila, I wondered if you can talk about, uh, and I guess everyone, like what's the, the next stage of this work? Like what's happening next? But Jamila, specifically with you, I noticed that all the things that you were talking about at the end there were higher ed, like wins, like wins in higher ed at Colby College and UC system. Uh, but initially you had talked about Cisco. So I'm wondering like, what's the landscape of like corporate, uh anti-discrimination against caste or even like uh state legislation or anything like that is there anything like that happening or is equality labs or equity labs working on that yeah i mean their like phones are ringing constantly from new people all the time i think after the cisco case came out equality labs actually put out a call for like if anyone has experienced caste discrimination in tech please reach out and they got hundreds of um like disclosures of caste discrimination. So I think I know that they've done a lot of trainings with big corporate companies. Um, and that's like, you know, more of the 
checking the box. Oh, we did a training because this has been, this concern has been expressed, but I think like it's constantly changing. Like I have to read the news every day to see what's happening because articles are constantly coming out. And I think that the, like both what's happening in higher ed paired with, you know, these corporate companies realizing that they can't get away with this is like a really powerful new surge. Um, and I think like something I didn't even touch upon at all in the presentation is the opposition. There's a large opposition in the US um, of like those affiliated with like the right wing ideology that currently um, dominates political affairs in India. Like there's a lot of those people in the US because the the like South Asian, specifically Indian diaspora is like disproportionately of those like very, very dominant castes. Um, so I think all of these things are like constantly going and intersecting and creating this kind of very uneven environment that's kind of difficult to navigate, but Equality Labs has been doing it with such grace. Um, and like other Dalit organizations as well. It's really beautiful to see. Others, next steps for this work? Kuna, when can people access the archives? So they're currently in the process of hiring like a formal archivist to come in, which hopefully will happen next fall. Um, but yeah, so at the present, we're still, I'm currently working with like the books right now, his published books, because something that's been really meaningful that we were able to finesse is uh, all of the books that Brown doesn't have access to are being donated to Tougaloo College, um, which is really awesome. So that is happening now, but I mean, these like library acquisitions take so long. So I think that the archives will probably be like, probably like a couple months to a year. I'm curious how this has sort of shifted your thinking in terms of kind of long-term pursuits as well. Um, if this is something that, if the how you imagine this work sort of being taken up kind of long-term for you. Um, and I guess kind of connected with that, I mean, I'm really impressed. I understand this work is all part of a longer trajectory for the kinds of projects that you're each working on, but you each narrated it really beautifully of like, this was the Royce project and this was outside the Royce project, which I found really interesting. And that like, in some ways it's like, it's all the work that you do, but you had a really particular sense of what was the Royce project. So I guess I'm curious how you're thinking about like what the Royce project is as an iteration of this work and then sort of the long-term um, ways that you hope to continue working on this. And maybe it helps too to think about an audience of like, if you're talking to a Royce applicant, how would you describe what a manageable Royce project looks like. I think for me, um, I've kind of like always known that I wanted to work in immigration policy or advocacy. And so um, my Royce project was like an opportunity to learn about something within that interest that I previously had not had the opportunity to study in any of my courses or in any capacity. Um, so that was like a really valuable space to explore that alongside the support of um, some faculty and community partners. Um, yeah, so my, my Rice project wasn't part of like a senior thesis or any kind of like long-term project like that. It was kind of just like an exploratory um, project and like source of learning for me, but um, I think it's provided me with like a more robust understanding of the immigration system, as well as racism, as well as language justice, which I previously had not done much work around. Um, and I think those will be really valuable skills as I like move forward to find a job maybe um, in that area.
I think for me, like the Royce was a really unique opportunity to do something that was unstructured or that I created the structure for. Um, because I think that like there were weeks where I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not moving forward at all. I'm not doing anything. But I think that it's nice to look back after, you know, it's been like almost a year since that time. And like even putting together this presentation, like, oh, like actually I did do a lot of things during that time. And it wasn't like, you know, just because I didn't accomplish my initial goal doesn't mean that, you know, I didn't accomplish anything. Um, and I think that it was so important and like wonderful just to meet with so many organizers and knowing that those relationships that I have are going to be ones that I hopefully have years down the line um, as I continue to organize with them. And like, I think definitely gave me some clarity in what I wanna do moving forward. Hopefully still work in the same kind of general area of caste discrimination um, and South Asian organizing. So it's definitely, you know, kind of helped me be very reflective and find clarity. I think that's so interesting as sort of like a kind of nudge to like reach out to people who you'd otherwise want to talk to anyway, but it sort of gives you that excuse to like make those connections. And I feel like you all have done a really thoughtful job of building community around topics that you're interested in. And maybe the voice is something that kind of prompts you to like do that work, to reach out, send the email, make the phone call or the introduction. So I really appreciate that. And just that highlighting of unstructured time, I think. We were talking yesterday, um, Ashlyn was talking about like planting corn and it didn't initially make sense of like, I'm not really doing my project and planting corn. And I was like, oh, I am doing my project. And I think this realization that those unstructured activities that feel like it's not the work that you envisioned is in fact your project is such an interesting conception and that you're then able to go back and narrate like, oh, all of these kind of other moments was the work. So that's really cool. Do others have thoughts on this? Yeah, Nick, I'm wondering if this affects your artistic practice yourself. I also want to know the name of the kitten. Um, the kitten is named Findus after a uh, Swedish children's book. Um, but my artistic practice, uh, unfortunately, is is not that impacted. Uh, I think I I sort of put myself through the ringer and then came back to. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm working with with solvents, and you know, who knows where they go. Um, but definitely, I mean, a, a couple things that didn't come up in my presentation, um, like I, I I attended a virtual conference on um, sustainability in like museums. Um, this is with Art Switch, a Dutch organization. Um, that was something I would never have uh, thought about, about the costs of, of storage and shipping and um, gallery restructuring. Um, so I, I think I'm more thoughtful, but I think I'm just as damaging as ever. Um, so I'm, I take knowledge forward and don't apply it, I think. At least you know that that's happening. Final thoughts, questions, words of wisdom. Thank you both for all your support over this last year. It's actually been a very long time. <laughs> yes, but a joyous time, at least that offer. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. Thanks people who are watching us at a future date. Uh, have good lives. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.